Well, good morning, North Greenville. How are y'all doing? It's morning, it's early, and that stinks, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 3. Uh, it's good to be back here at North Greenville. I was never an undergrad student, so I never sat here in chapel uh, like you did, but uh, we came here a lot uh, when I was a teenager to the summer camp centrifuge, and um, the Lord was very gracious during that time, and right, I think about here, though the stage is a little bit different, uh, when I was a teenager, the Lord called me uh, to ministry, and I got to come back here and, and do uh, my master's degree, so if you're thinking about graduate studies, I uh, hope you'll consider uh, the grad school here at North Greenville. There are a ton of great uh, majors. Uh, I teach a class in the Graduate School of Christian Ministry, and so um, I'm going to plug my class. If you start in the fall, take the Christian Education elective that's offered online in the fall, and now that I've said it, I know the class will make, and so um, thank you for supporting these hungry children on the front row who are mine uh, through your education dollars. I want to ask you a question this morning. Uh, how do you prepare when something important is happening in your life? If, if you're uh, preparing for something, how, how do you take time to prepare? Uh, some of your athletes, and so when you have a game coming up or a match coming up, uh, you have a certain uh, number of things that you do to prepare for that. When the semester's starting, uh, you might do something to get your dorm room prepared. Maybe some of you, uh, when you graduate, you're going to get married and you're doing some things uh, to prepare for that. And I can tell you there are not enough things you can do to be prepared for that, but you better try to be prepared because it's kind of important. What do you do? What do you do to be prepared when something important is coming in life? Matthew chapter 3 is a passage for us in verses 1 through 12 where a man named John was sent to prepare the way for Jesus. That was his goal. That was his task in life. That's why he was sent to prepare the way for the Lord. And in what we see and in the way that he teaches and the things that he teaches, we see ways that we can also be prepared because Jesus has come. And with Jesus coming, we see that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand for all people. And each one of us in here this morning, no matter where we are in our spiritual journey, we need to be keenly aware that preparations need to be made for the coming of the kingdom. And so you may be here as someone who is simply, this is the school you chose to come to and you really don't care that much about this Christianity thing and, and that, that is perfectly fine for you to do. But let me help you understand you need to be prepared. And if you came here because this is a distinctly Christian school that has as its motto where Christ makes the difference, can I tell you that you also need to be prepared for the coming of the kingdom? A kingdom that the Bible tells us has already started because Christ has come, but we have not yet seen it fully realized. I want to read for us. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12 this morning, so you can turn there or scroll there or whatever you do to get to your copy of God's Word. The Bible says this, now, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. He was a strange dude. We can, we can get that. I'm not calling you this morning to eat locusts and wild honey, so that's not where this is going. So you don't have to check out yet. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going after him and they were baptizing, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. 
But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. In the time we have this morning, I want to encourage you that there are five preparations that you need to make with the kingdom at hand. Five things that you need to do to prepare for the kingdom that is coming. The kingdom that's already arrived. And this one day that, that John talks about here and Jesus talks about extensively when he separates the sheep from the goats, he separates And to those who know him and those who don't, that day of judgment that he's talking about. Five things we we all need to do to be prepared. The first we see in verse 2 is there is a call to repent. Now, I realize that that may not be the the favorite word. This is why I only get invited every couple of, well, about a decade between because I talk about things like this. Maybe you've heard this word before. It's not a bad word. It's actually a good word. It's a, it's a great word for us because repent is this idea that we're going in one direction and we need to change and go in another direction. John the Baptist tells them, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, you're going the wrong direction and the kingdom is coming and you need to go in the direction of the kingdom. And what do we need to repent from? Well, we need to repent of the fact that we have sin in our life that, that we so often don't deal with. We We have the the ultimate sin, this rebellion against God, the pride that's in our life that says we can do it our own way. We know better than everybody else. We know better than God. The the first sin that we see in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3 was was simply Adam and Eve saying, we know better than God. God. John the Baptist says that problem is still persisting today. And with Jesus coming, with the kingdom of heaven at hand, you need to turn from doing it your way and begin to do it God's way. You need to turn from saying, I'm in charge, I'm the king, I'm the queen of my own world, my own destiny, and say that Jesus is Lord of my life. In our sin, we follow after our own desires, but in repentance, we acknowledge Jesus as Lord and we follow after his priorities. Jesus will say in Matthew chapter 5, when he he talks about the the Beatitudes there in the first few verses, he, he talks about the blessing of the poor of spirit. Those who acknowledge that they are spiritually impoverished and have no hope without God. Maybe this morning to prepare yourself for the kingdom, you need to turn from your sin and follow Christ. You've never done that before. You've never followed him before. You do it your own way. You make your own decisions. You rule over your life. Here's the reality. You do not rule over your life. It just means sin rules over your life. Sin is your master. Destruction is your master. And yet Jesus this morning is calling you through his word to turn because the kingdom is at hand. To turn and follow him. To repent of your sin and believe his good news. And this is not simply John's words, but we find not many verses later Jesus saying the same thing. The message is consistent. All of us, all people everywhere need to turn from their sin and follow after our good and gracious Savior. He is to be our master and our Lord. I would ask you this morning, have you made that preparation with the kingdom at hand? Have you repented? 
Whether you have never followed Christ before or you have been a believer since you were a small child, have you consistently turned from your sin? Because Christians, let me tell you, we need to consistently turn from our sin. We follow Jesus for a while, but but the temptations of the world, the desires of our flesh begin to pull us back toward that old way and we need to turn afresh to Jesus and follow him. Go in his direction. Obey his voice. Repentance. We need to repent because the kingdom is at hand. The second thing we see take place here is there is confession of sins. Look, we have all these people and they're coming to John. They want to be baptized. They're they're coming from all over the region. He is a rock star. You know, rock stars are sometimes a little weird, right? Well, John the Baptist was a little weird, so he makes sense. He's the rock star, and everyone is coming to hear John and to be baptized by him. And what do they do when they come? They confess their sins. See, the reality is before God, nothing is hidden. And these people are confessing their sins. It takes a lot of spiritual maturity to confess our sin and our shortcoming to other people. To to tell other people that, that we have struggles, that we have difficulties, that we have failed to live up to the expectations that God has for us. Friends, that's difficult. And yet it's so very necessary. Some of you have no doubt heard about these events that have been going on on other college campuses across the the country. Some of you no doubt have a desire for that to take place in your life. And I I know for many in your university, they they want that here. They want God to to move in his spirit. They want want a, a a fresh awakening, especially among college students, because you're so very important to the kingdom. Can I tell you that one of the things that brings me encouragement as I hear about things happening elsewhere is that people are willing to be transparent with others and confess their sins. Confess that they aren't perfect. It's one of the great charges we hear against the church all the time is that the church is full of hypocrites. Some of you no doubt believe that because you have seen it. People who said things in the church and they did not live like that. You saw them doing something other than what they said. Can I tell you that confession helps us to deal with our hypocrisy because we are transparent with people and help them to know that we are sinners saved by grace. Not people who have it all together, not people who have it all figured out. But these people come and with humility they are baptized by this strange man in the wilderness who is eating this weird diet and is dressed oddly. And yet because God is moving in their life, they are confessing their sins. Friends, we need to do the same. Confession of sin is of the utmost importance as we prepare for the kingdom. Because the one who rules over the kingdom, Jesus who rules over the kingdom, is well aware of our sin. It was our sin that put him upon the cross. He knows our sin intimately. And so it's not hidden from him. And confession Confession shows that we are dealing with our sin, that we are putting it to death in our life, that we have truly repented from our way and have turned to Christ. To prepare for the kingdom, you need to repent, you need to confess your sin. And then we see baptism. This seems like an odd one. Many of you have been baptized. You don't need to be rebaptized. And yet baptism is an important part of preparation for the kingdom. When a person follows after Christ, they are to go and be baptized. It's a public confession of what they are doing. As they are confessing their sins here, they are being baptized. And Jesus, we're told, is going to come later after John, and his baptism will be different than John. 
John says, I baptize with water, but there's one coming and he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. To those who know him, to those who follow him, the Spirit of God is given to them and dwells within them. If you're a believer this morning, the Holy Spirit lives within you. He's your helper and your comforter. He's also going to baptize with fire. We have a, a picture here in, in Matthew chapter 3 of, of the fire of judgment coming. And Jesus, his mission as he, as he calls people to himself, as he, he gives the spirit to his followers and there is fire for those who reject him. The question this morning is, if you are a believer, are you living as one who's been baptized in the spirit that you're following him, that those fruits of the Spirit that Paul writes about are evident in your life, that we see love and joy. We see patience and kindness, self-control and gentleness present in your life because the Spirit of God is directing you. Maybe you're a believer and you've never been baptized. Friends, that's not a great way to start out following after Jesus. We're called, we're commanded to be baptized. We see that pattern in the New Testament where people, they go joyfully to be baptized because they want to show that they're now followers of Christ. As you're preparing for the kingdom, make sure that you've been baptized by, by water to show that you're following Christ. Make sure you've been baptized in the Spirit, that the Spirit directs your life to show that you have repented of your sin and believed his good news. We repent, we confess our sins, we're baptized. Fourth, we, we're called to bear fruit. Look at verse 8. These, these religious leaders come to him in verse 7 and he, he calls them a name, he calls them a brood of vipers. I don't know exactly how that would translate now to you calling someone a name, but it doesn't seem very nice. And he asked them, who, who warned you? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he says this, he says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. See, these religious leaders would no doubt, well, be religious, because that's what religious leaders do. I think on, on my Twitter account, you know, the option doesn't have preachers, so it says uh, spiritual leader, I think is what it says. That's about the best Twitter could come up with. Maybe y'all can tweet Elon Musk and encourage him to say pastor is like the option for what you are. But religious leaders, we do religious things, spiritual things. We, we preach and pray and sing songs and work at universities and things like that. But when he sees them, there's a hollowness to their religion. And he tells them that they need to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, the fruit that they bear should show that they have turned from their sin and that God is the king of their life. It's amazing to me that there are people who call themselves Christians that are somehow still the kings and queens of their life. That's not how that works. The calling we have, if you're a Christian this morning, is to bear fruit in your life that shows that Jesus has transformed your life. And so the fruit will be for him and not for you. Because can I just tell you that sometimes religious people, they spend a lot of time planting watering, cultivating fruit for themselves. We want to make a name for ourselves. We want to be somebody. We want to get some recognition. Some of you might come from a church like that. The church is all about themselves. It can be a little church, it can be a medium-sized church, it could be a big church, but, but who are they bearing fruit for? Is it all about the church? Is it all about the people? 
Or are they bearing fruit that shows that they have turned from doing it their way and now they're doing it God's way? That they're living, they're living in light of the fact that the kingdom of God has come. And that there are people all around them who need to encounter Jesus. Is that the way you're living? If you're a believer, it's really easy to get caught up in doing life for ourselves. You're in college, you're trying to study, you're trying to have a career. Some of you will do something as a, a Christian in a secular environment. You'll work in a bank or in a school. Some of you want to be youth pastors and pastors and missionaries. But for all those things, we can, we can bear fruit that's only for us. But that's not what he says. He says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Stop living religiously for yourselves, what you can gain, what you can get, what you stand to inherit from God, but rather what God has called you to do. This book, if you're familiar with Matthew, ends in Matthew 28 with the Great Commission. And Jesus tells his disciples right before he ascends to the Father, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. Not take care of yourselves, not make yourself number one, but all these things that you have seen through all of these chapters of Matthew, all of these things you've encountered, all of this teaching that I have done, Jesus says, go and tell other people about it. Go to the entire world, tell them everything that I have said, baptize them, and know that I'm always with you. Is that what your life looks like? Because that's how you prepare for the kingdom if you are a believer, is by going and making disciples of other people and sharing with them, not your opinion, not what you think, but what Jesus has taught. Because his words are life-transforming. His spirit is life-giving. If you're a believer, he has brought you out of darkness and put you in his marvelous light. And he didn't do that for you. He did that for his glory. He did that to make much of his name. He did that so that you would go and share his good news with people all over the world who need to hear the name of Jesus. If you want to be prepared for the kingdom that is coming, the kingdom that is here, the kingdom that will soon be fully realized, then you've got to bear fruit. You've got to bear fruit in keeping with repentance, fruit that shows that life transformation has taken place in your heart, that you have been baptized by the Spirit. You must bear fruit. And then fifth, got to repent and confess our sins, be baptized and bear fruit. And the, the fifth thing that we see from John the Baptist here is that you need to check your heart. You need and I need to be consistently evaluating my heart. We cannot act like we have it all figured out. We cannot act like we are better than we are. Look at what he says in verse 9. He says, do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is, able to, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. How does that kind of compute to us? See, some of you think that your relationship with God is stout and strong and unbreakable because you go to North Greenville University. For some of you, that made your parents exceptionally happy. You went to a Christian school. They're going to teach you good things. And that is the basis on which you see your relationship with Jesus. You grew up in church. You were baptized. You walked the aisle when you were a kid. You signed a card. You even went to a good church. Like they really teach the Bible there. And yet everything else in your life looks exactly like 
everyone else you would meet who would claim no relationship with Jesus. You go through the motions, you come to chapel, you still go to church, whatever it is, but there is nothing, there is nothing in your heart and in your life that looks like you really follow Jesus. You just checked all the boxes. These religious leaders come and they can say, hey, we are children of Abraham. Man, that means we got it all together. I can trace my lineage all the way back to Abraham. I know who I am. My history says that I have a great relationship with God. And John says, check your heart. Check your heart. And what you'll find is someone who does not have it all together. What you'll find is someone who does not have the relationship with God that they presume to have. Jesus will say in a couple chapters, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. What do you hunger after? What does your heart really desire? Because I meet a lot of Christians who desire something emotional. They desire something temporary. They desire something that is very self-centered. If they check their heart, they would find that Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 does not apply to them. They do not hunger and thirst after righteousness. And Jesus says the one who does will be what? Satisfied. But if you hunger after everything else, you hunger after the passions of your flesh, the joys of this world. It doesn't matter if you check off all the boxes. If there is no hunger in your heart for righteousness, you will not be satisfied. You'll fill it with all kinds of things, but you will never be satisfied in Christ if your desire is not after righteousness. And what happens? John tells those religious leaders that the ax is laid to the root of the tree. If the tree doesn't bear good fruit, it's cast into the fire. He says later his winnowing fork in verse 12 is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Christian, when's the last time you checked your heart? When's the last time you you really sat down and evaluated where you are with God? Where you took the time to ask, do I really hunger and thirst after righteousness? Or am I just playing some game because that's what my parents expect? I'm playing some game because it's what I've always done. I I go to church because I, I got friends there or I... I went to the Christian school because it seemed like a a good place to go, but you never looked and saw, are the things that I'm doing in my life, things that bear fruit for the kingdom because I have a hunger and a thirst after righteousness. See, here's the reality. The kingdom is here. A day of judgment is coming. And friends, our time is exceptionally short. I'm only about 20 years older than most of you, but it seems like it was yesterday when I was sitting there and there was a band on stage for youth camp. And I've come to realize that, that I'll blink a few more times and I'll be near the end of my life. And there's some people that, that look at my life and they would look at my resume with all of its, its accomplishments and say, oh, look how much you've done. And yet I have this burning in my heart all the time that I'm not making good use of the time that God has given me. And it eats away at me that I've not spent enough time checking my heart and hungering and thirsting after righteousness and bearing fruit for the kingdom. And friends, I don't want that to happen to you because our time is short and God has given us this life to make much of him to make disciples of all nations and to share with them the good news. And so I'd ask you this morning, have you made preparations 
for the kingdom. We can spend our time in so many other things, but have we prepared ourselves for the fact that Jesus has come? He has called all men and women to follow him. And our time is short. Have you made preparations for the kingdom? Bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your peace and your truth. We thank you that you love us and that you care for us with with a love that is exceedingly above any other love we will ever experience. God, we're thankful this morning that you you offer to each person gathered here the opportunity to follow after you. Whether they know you and they need to turn from sin and follow you afresh, God, make the desire of our heart, the hunger and thirst that we have be for righteousness. Let it be for your namesake. God, all those here who don't know you, God, I pray that you would call them to yourself, that they would desire to follow you because of your goodness and grace. God, my prayer is that each one of us would respond to your word. We would do so in obedience because you love us. God, we thank you for your grace and truth, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.